Hi everyone and welcome to Vets and Pets Pet Emergency Webinar. Today we have Dr. Dave teaching us about what to do when we have an emergency situation with our pets. First, just some housekeeping. There is a box for you all to write and send questions in. Can you all do that? People say hi. Oh good, I can see people saying hi now. Alright, well if you have any questions during the webinar, please feel free to ask and we'll try and get to them at the end. We are going to be pressed for time, so let's start. Hi Dave, how are you today? Hey Jess, I'm very well, thank you. How are you going? Good, good. Okay, today, as we all know, Dr. Dave is going to start by telling us about 11 common pet emergencies we can face, as well as some hints and tips about what we as pet owners can do before getting them to a vet. I'll let Dave take over now. Okay, thanks Jess. Um, welcome everybody on the call. Um, it's great to be here and it's great to have you here. We've got a really cool topic for you tonight. Um, and it's a really important topic. Um, you know, one of the things that we see um, in practices quite often are, are pets that have gotten themselves in a bit of trouble. And sometimes, you know, the trouble was avoidable and other times the trouble could have been dealt with a little faster. So what our objective tonight with this webinar is to just open your eyes to what is really a genuine emergency and something you you should contact us as directly pretty quickly and kind of not mess around with Dr. Google and, and sort of a problem. Um, so as vets have a list of what we call the true emergencies and we're going to we're going to run through that tonight for you. Um, so before we do that, just wanted to introduce myself a little bit more. My name is Dr. Dave Nichol. I'm the owner and director and senior vet at Dr. Dave's Vets and Pets. Um, you'll tell from my accent, I'm not of these shores. I've been in Sydney in Australia for the last five years. Um, I've been practicing as a vet for the last 16 years and I've worked emergency back in the UK for several years and I have seen and treated and dealt with everything that we are going to talk about tonight. Um, so it's my pleasure to speak to you and I hope you get something very useful out of this this evening. The presentation is designed to be pretty short and punchy. We're not going to have you here for a couple of hours. Um, this isn't a, a lecture for veterinary degree. It's just to help you as pet owners understand some of the things that are going to keep your pets out of trouble and happy and healthy. Um, so. Uh, what we're going to cover um, are, as Jess mentioned, there are, there are really about 11 true emergencies that we see in veterinary medicine, okay? And I kind of would add in the caveat here that at the practice, we actually, although there are 11 emergencies to us as vets, often things can seem really scary to you as pet owners. So we never dismiss anything that, that you feel is an emergency. So, you know, so if something's, something's bad and we need you to come in or you feel like it's urgent, then we're always going to see that, um, at the very least give you some peace of mind. Okay, But tonight we're going to focus on what are the true medical emergencies. And we're going to talk about you know, how you spot them coming, how you can um, you can see where the problem is, when to take action, and in some of these cases, what you can do to, to deal with them yourself or to alleviate them or to give your pet a better outcome, um, or indeed to prevent them happening in the first instance, which is always our objective at this practice, okay? And as we thank you for coming in tonight, we've got a little free gift, which I will uh, make you aware of at the end of the webinar. Now, tonight's webinar is sponsored by Pet Plan. Pet Plan are an insurance company, and uh, we're very grateful for their sponsorship of this webinar. Um, so let's keep cracking on. Now, these slides are not like my typical slides. I often put very big pictures up and very little in the way of words. And I thought that it mightn't be a bad idea tonight to not do that, given the, the topic um, that we might have some fairly gross slides. So we are not going to gross you out with horrible pictures this evening. So you don't have to adjust your, your sets or, or you know dim the computer or anything like that, OK? There's going to be no nasty surprises here. So let's crack on with emergency one. Um, Blood loss. It's a pretty obvious one. If your pet's cut or bleeding, then that can be a problem. Now, there's kind of two categories here. There's bleeding that is a large volume of blood or um, is happening very, very severely or acutely, so it's in a short space of time. Um, 
And there's bleeding that's more chronic, that is something that lasts a little bit longer or has been going on for a little while, and perhaps the volume of blood loss isn't as big, but it's happening in weird places where you kind of wouldn't expect it, okay? Now, obviously, the, 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 cuts, the cut artery is a big deal, and I have seen several of these over the years. It's often a dog that has been uh, out on a run in the park or running in a riverbed um, or around the harbour and it's, it's cut its foot on something really sharp, so oyster shells or a, a, a tin or a broken bottle or something that's not obvious above the surface of the water or in a riverbank or something like that or in a park. And they've just slashed through that and often the dogs don't even notice they've done it. They're just charging around there and they run up to you and there's just this trail of red behind them and that's pretty scary stuff. I actually had one, one client back in the UK and her dog severed um, all of the arteries across the back of its wrist and you know the the owner was a long way from her car and, and, and took a wee while to actually get to the hospital and that dog came pretty close uh, and she came pretty close to losing that dog um, so you know dogs don't have as much blood as we have uh, and what is really important in that situation is to stop the bleeding quickly and if you're like half an hour away, or let's be honest, in Australia, you could be a long way away from a vet. It really does pay to have something like bandage material. And your vet can supply you with bandage material. You're just looking for a tourniquet effect that just squishes the cut edges together. And that, that stops the bleeding temporarily. Now, it's not going to fix it, but it is just going to make sure that, that, that your pet lives long enough to get that addressed properly in a clinic okay so the acute bleeding incident and listen it's uh, it's not that common that you get them so bad that they're in in severe danger from those but if there's a lot of blood that keeps coming I mean we're not just talking a drip here we're talking about a lot of blood or any cut that keeps bleeding for longer than five minutes and that really is something you've you've got to get to your vet ASAP okay now the other the flip side of that the blood that's in the urine or in the poop or a pet that's coughing up blood, or there's blood coming from the nose, or ears, or you know your cat's come in and it's it's suddenly got the cut on the side that's bleeding. You know those are things that are peculiar. They're not normal, and so we do treat them as emergencies as well because blood in the urine can be a sign of bladder stones or tumors or um, or severe infections that can damage the kidneys in the poop it can be a sign of things like parvovirus infection and coughing up blood is never a good thing to be happening okay so that's bleeding and that's the first emergency so emergency two choking a persistent cough so we're not talking about, you know, your dog has just wandered around the house and, you know, it's eaten something it shouldn't and then it hacks it back up. Um, we're talking about the cough that just keeps going. And, and this goes for cats as well. And listen, guys, it's actually really hard to know if your cat's coughing or sneezing or just doing something weird. I always say cats are just not like small dogs. They're just, they're kind of a law unto themselves. They're, they're a bit special. Um... And so, you know, when 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 you have a, when you have an animal that, that, that in cats particularly, they just do this weird thing where they just stick their elbows out, their head down, and they sort of almost half gag, half sneeze, half cough, and it's pretty hard to spot that as a cough. But a cat that's coughing persistently, that can be a real big problem. So, cat owners. If your cat's doing anything like that, you need to get that checked out. The classic thing we're looking for there is asthma. And asthma can rapidly progress to a life-threatening situation in cats. And a lot more cats have it than are ever diagnosed with it. Because, mostly, not because vets can't spot it, but because it's actually pretty hard to spot cats that are having a cough. Now, obviously, if your pet is choking on something, and again, that may look like coughing. It may look like irritation or, you know, pawing at the back of the, at the mouth. But it may just be that it cannot breathe. Then that's clearly something you have to get to vet immediately. And difficulty breathing, um, you know, that's that's one of those things that, um, again, I think it's a little harder to to spot. 
But I usually say to people, um, if you were to see your, watch your pet's breathing normally, this is kind of a useful thing to do. If your pet's totally normal, I would count how many breaths a minute it takes at home. Okay, now most pets, when they're kind of chilled out and calm, and certainly most dogs, will have a breathing rate like less than 20, somewhere between maybe 15 and 25 breaths in a whole minute, okay? Uh, a pet that's re relaxed, that is, okay, so not after you've taken them for a walk or, you know, run them hard or been playing games, but a pet that's sleeping or it's calm and nice and relaxed in its bed or sitting on your lap or when it, whatever you're doing when it's nice and calm. Um then what I would suggest is measure that. Um, if the breathing rate gets above 30, and certainly if it's getting above 40, that's an abnormally fast breathing rate. And we typically associate that with heart disease. And of course, in dogs, um, we usually spot other signs of heart disease because they slow down, and they don't like walking as much. Um, but in cats, you know, you don't take your cat for a walk twice a day, right? Um, well, I don't take my cats for a walk twice a day. They kind of cruise around a little bit, and they sit in the back of the sofa, and they sleep for the other 23 hours of a day. So they just aren't, they're not exercising that much. So when a cat starts developing breathing problems, that's a really good thing to spot, because almost never do we have a cat brought in before they're in a really acute crisis with a heart problem, okay? Um, and it's just not subtle with cats at all when that problem's there. They just they just fall to bits basically, and they're having real problems breathing, and they they behave very very weirdly. So you won't have any difficulty spotting that as an emergency situation, but also a lot harder for us to get them back from that situation. If you can measure their breathing rate, I think that's an awesome thing to do. Okay, so if your pet's choking, persistent coughing, or breath breathing rate. Um, that is that is above 30 or 40 breaths in a minute, or it just looks labored, you know, the chest is really heaving up and down, then that needs attention, and attention pretty quick. Okay. Dave, we've just had one good question by Steve, who's in Oatlands. He wants to know if his cat, you know, looks like he's breathing normally, but it's really loud, would he, you still consider that an emergency? So by breathing normally, I don't know if Steve can clarify this, I, I'm going to assume like the distance the chest moves looks calm and the, the, the number of breaths in a minute has remained the same but there's just a different noise there or is it just that his cat or your cat Steve um, makes this noise all the time? If it's something like uh, some pets will make more noise breathing than others. Now, it's, it's, if you have a dog like a pug, for example, then you can expect a lot of noise to be normal when, when they're breathing. But a cat, you really shouldn't be hearing anything. Now, if the breathing rate and the effort going into breathing is pretty normal, then I would be wondering more about you know something in the upper respiratory tract, like a uh, um, you know, some cats have chronic cat flu, and we call it snuffles, and they have this wheezy sort of snuffly noise when they breathe, but it doesn't necessarily affect their breathing too badly in, in a lot of cases. Um, so I would still say it's something to get checked out, but it's not necessarily something I would consider an emergency. You're really looking for a big effort uh, and a, a big, big rate, or either of those two things. I hope that answers Steve's question. Perhaps if he can come back to us in the chat box and let us know if that did or not, that would be awesome. Was that the only question just now, Jess? Yep, just now. Okay, cool. Button whenever you've got anything. That's all good. We'll have a little time for questions at the end as well, depending on how much I yak as we go through the presentation. <laughs> okay, let's keep going. Emergency number three. If your pet cannot pee or poop or it yells out in pain when it's doing either of those things, that's bad. Why is that an emergency, do you ask? Well, particularly with peeing, if your pet tries to pee and it fails, it's very, very likely there's some obstruction. Uh, in dogs, that almost always means there's a bladder stone that's, that's blocked the, ure uh, the urethra. 
Um, and in cats, that can mean something similar, or there's just an, a spasm in the bladder neck, and but for whatever reason, urine's not getting out of the bladder. Now, what happens in that situation is the kidneys keep producing urine, so your bladder gets bigger and bigger and bigger, and at a certain point, the pressure in there just gets so big, it forces urine back up in the kidneys, and the kidneys just shut down. Okay. Um, and you can imagine, like, just imagine the feeling of having to go for a wee but not being able to, and then pushing past that feeling to the point where your bladder feels like it's literally going to pop. Okay, and in some of these cases, it does pop. So the inability to pee is really serious. And, you know, we can get them back from that situation, but they often need really on the spot sort of um, surgical intervention of some kind or other um, to bring them back from the brink of those guys, okay? Now, crying in pain, like I put that in there because if they can get weird poop out, then they may not be in an emergency situation, but pain when they're doing either of those things is definitely a, a sort of a sign that problems are just around the corner. And, you know, we'd be thinking like cystitis and you can imagine, like, you know how much cystitis hurts, right? Like if people who've had cystitis, it just feels like you're on fire uh, in your bladder. Um, and if they're not able to poop, then we're thinking constipation. Now, interestingly, a lot of these things, there's not necessarily stuff you can do once they've happened. They mostly need to be managed in a hospital. But most of the obstructions I've seen... Uh, particularly in constipations, um, have been dogs that have chewed a lot of bones. They've eaten a whole bunch of bones down and they've just um, they've just gotten stuck and they get into the colon they just don't go anywhere. Now that's that that can be really serious if that gets super blocked. Um, because enemas at that point not, are not necessarily going to cut it and you could be looking at a surgery and that is not nice surgery to do. Um, so I would always be a little bit wary of bones and quite a few of the emergencies I've had to deal with in Australia have been related to feeding of bones. So that's just a little aside there. I don't recommend it. I would sincerely advise you to stay away from giving bones, whether they're cooked or raw. I don't think it's a good call. Okay. All right. Emergency four. If your pet has an injury to its eyeball that needs to be seen pronto. The eyes are just too precious to leave to hang around for a few days and, and see what happens. Um, you know, so I, I, I really deliberately didn't want to put any photos of eye injuries up because I know it makes people really squeamish, but I, I have seen them, I like eyeballs on literally their stalks. I've seen eyeballs cut, damaged, even little ulcers. Like if your pet runs into a bush and it comes home and it's squinting its eye up, like if they have a little little bit of a thorn or something in the eyeball that's not a big deal always to remove but if you leave it there for three or four days and an infection gets going it can cost your pet his eye um, so eyeball injuries definitely need to be seen pronto number five um, poisoning now whether you know or you just suspect that your pet ate something um, that it shouldn't have that needs to be dealt with quickly and you know we, d we don't have a really awesome um, immediately telephonable reference for all of the different toxins or plants or things that, that your pet might have eaten like other countries have that but we don't have that here in Australia um, and generally it's just best to err on the side of caution now the, obviously calling up your vet and not googling so I had a call the other day from a client who had um, they were on medication and their pet had eaten some of their own medication and you know the doses that we take are obviously a lot higher than, than a dog would take in many many cases um, so almost always that's going to be some form of an overdose and let me tell you from the records that are kept at the poisons bureau back in the UK and this will surprise you the top two almost every year for the last decade and the top two most common poisonings uh, in dogs were ibuprofen so Nurofen and Panadol paracetamol okay commonly taken household painkillers for us and I'll tell you the really scary thing is 
all, a lot of those dogs got given them very deliberately by their owner. Now, they didn't give them to poison them. They gave them because their pet seemed to be in pain for some other reason. And they thought, hey, well, that's a painkiller I would take. I'll just give it to my pet. Well, those two drugs are extremely toxic to dogs. Um, and you'll, you will definitely induce bad things to happen if you give human doses of those things to your pets. So don't give paracetamol ibuprofen. But in any case, if your pet has eaten a plant uh, or is, and cats particularly, let's just mention lilies here for cats. And the other common one that, that, that happens by accident is using a product like Advantix or actually a lot of the supermarket flea products for cats because they don't work. They very well. People double dose them or they use the dog one by accident and cats are super sensitive to pyrethrins and you'll put a cat in a coma really quickly by, by using those products. So um, in any case, you, you need to be aware of what things are toxic to your pets and if you accidentally give it or your pet steals it, like the dog might steal chocolate at Easter or Christmas, then you need to call us immediately. And usually if we can, you know, if it, absorption of these things takes a little while. And if you can get to a vet inside a half an hour, we can do something to make your pet sick and get them onto some supportive care. And in almost all cases, things are going to be okay there. Um, but time is absolutely of the essence for these guys. So you know, and, and you know what, these are also ones that happen when you you sort of least expect it or you least want it, like at Christmas the families come round and you know, everything's going great and suddenly the dog just demolishes a selection box or a bunch of chocolate and you think, oh no don't leave that to see how they go, otherwise it's going to ruin your party, that's for sure okay keep cracking on, emergency number six, seizures collapsing or unconsciousness. Now this covers all. Like there are so many conditions could cause these symptoms. Uh, and we're, we're, I'm, I'm not going to be able to talk about all of the different things that cause it, but just know that if these symptoms are happening, that is an emergency case. Okay. Now seizures are like, I can't, can't, I can't tell you the number of calls I've had when I've worked out of ours emergency from clients whose pets are having a seizure. And the rule of thumb for us as vets is with a seizure, we always want to check your pet. But just scooping your pet up and bringing them directly to us isn't always the best call of action when they're having a seizure. Most seizures, they feel like they're, they're, they're I mean, they're kind of violent things. They're not nice to watch. Pets are completely unconscious on their side muscle tremoring, paddling away, that, I mean, you know, you have no doubt if your pet's having a seizure. Um, and one of the worst things you can do is overstimulate them in that moment. So you being stressed out and scooping up your pet and running out to the car and driving them around could just make the seizure worse. Most seizures are going to stop within a minute to three minutes. And one of the most important things you can do, and remember, if your pet has a seizure, is make it safe. So move your pet away from any risk areas to it. So if it's at the top of a set of stairs, you need to move it away from there. If it's nearby some uh, chairs or tables, and just move the, move everything away from your pet. Darken the room and be calm. I know that's easy to say and it's hard to do, but that's what's, ne that's what's best. You want to avoid any external stimulus because that can just make things worse get a stopwatch and try and count how long it's taking. Now here's your rule of thumb for if you have to immediately go to a vet. If that seizure is going on for more than five minutes, you have to come to us because there's a couple of things that are not working well in that pet's body. Number one, they're tremoring away so hard, their muscles are producing so much heat, they start to overheat. Number two, they're not breathing properly, so their oxygen levels start dropping. Uh, and number three, again, because they're burning up so much energy and their muscles are tremoring so much, their blood glucose starts to drop. So lots of heat in the body, lot, not a lot of oxygen, not a lot of glucose. This is really bad news for the brain. If that goes on for longer than 10 minutes, that's potentially permanent injury. So if your pet's having a seizure and it's lasting longer than five minutes, you got to scoop them up and bring them to the vet. Okay, because if you wait till 10 minutes and come along and it takes you five to get to the vet, that's 
that's potentially a drama. Okay. Um, now, collapsing or unconsciousness, um, you know, collapsing covers a whole host of things, um, but basically there's a there's a there's again there's a lot of different conditions whether it's overwhelming infection or paralysis ticks uh, intoxication or a joint infection you know none of the things that cause dogs and cats to collapse are you know there's no good things on that list and that needs to be checked out straight away equally unconsciousness will look unconsciousness like you might associate that with electrocution you might also associate it with heart disease um, it is actually very, very rare for a pet to to become unconscious, um, and I, I could I could certainly only list about three occasions in 16 years where um, animals have come into the clinic unconscious. Um, so you know you put drug overdoses in in there as well, um, but you you just you just wouldn't want to um, you wouldn't want to mess around in that situation. Okay. Any pet that's not putting any weight on its any of its limbs, or just not walking normally again. Okay, now the, the broken bone. Like basically, if if your pet is walking around on three legs, um, then there is either a fracture, or there is an infection, or there's some severe damage to something in that limb. Um, the most important reason that you have to get them to the vet is it's gonna hurt. I mean, a broken bone or a joint infection, there are very few things that are as acutely painful as those. And I'm sure if you've ever had either of those, you can relate very well to that. Um, if your pet's not walking normally, again, we're kind of more thinking neurological things, so maybe paralysis ticks again, or dogs that have got, a, they've slipped a disc in their back, they kind of walk weirdly at the back end as well. Um, you know, they often look a bit drunk at the back end. You know, the front can be okay, but the, the back end's a bit weird. Now, sometimes people think that just looks a bit funny. Well, well you know, literally amusing because the dog just looks a bit drunk. But trust me, quickly, either of those things can advance to, to some bad news. So um, any lameness issue um, that warrants checking out pretty quickly um, mostly because your pet's going to be in a lot of pain and we definitely don't want that okay which kind of segues rather nicely into emergency number eight which is your pet is in pain or is distressed now how, how do you spot an animal that's in pain that's like the million dollar question okay I like I'll give you a good example I treat dental disease every day I will probably operate on three or four pets I've got the sorts of mouths if you or I had them we would be literally screaming no matter how afraid we were of the dentist we would be screaming at the dentist to remove our teeth it would be that sore yet yeah, our pets continue eating they slow down a little bit um, they just you know they, they, they often don't vocalize or demonstrate their pain in ways that we detect obviously and you can imagine there's good um, there's good sort of reasons why that might be the case you can imagine an animal that demonstrates wild uh, like weakness in the wild is really just painting this big bullseye on its chest right I mean it's it's just saying eat me or you know kill me off now because I'm weak so there's a there's a there's a good sort of reason why animals don't always demonstrate pain in the way that we would sort of pick it up and I think it's really important for us to just acknowledge that so if your pet continues to eat or continues to do everything but has just slowed down a little bit doesn't have the same vitality or energy as it used to be used to have um, then I, I would take note of that I would I would certainly get that checked out for animals that are clearly and demonstrably in pain there is a huge issue going on there okay now pets can do they can go to opposite ends of the spectrum with this so an animal that is in severe pain and shock can just shut down and will be v very sleepy completely we'd, we'd call them flat in terms of their behavior they're just they're not just sleeping but they look like they want to die okay or they can go completely the other way and be very distressed and running around and vocalizing and whining and yelping and um, 
and meowing and, and can't settle and, and just seem very, very restless. If those things are happening, that is an emergency. If your pet has slowed down very gradually, well, I would still recommend you have that checked out because it's particularly when we talk about old dogs, we think about old dogs when, uh, when we talk about this a lot, but you know, the old dog that's slowed down, and if you're interested, I did a whole other webinar on this. You can you can pick that up off the website. But um, you know those guys are often in chronic pain. Well, you know that's that still needs treatment, but it's not what we consider an emergency. So a pet that is severely distressed or is profoundly quiet, that needs to be seen immediately. Emergency nine. So vomiting and diarrhea, like we see a lot of that. Um, in, in small animals, um, you know, dogs go to the park and they, dogs are dogs, they'll eat dumb stuff and cats are cats, they'll eat dumb stuff too. Um, and so, you know, like if your cat's gone eat, out and eaten a cockroach, guess what? Yeah, it might throw up because cockroaches carry some, you know, bad bugs, okay? But it doesn't mean your cat's an emergency at that stage. I guess the rule of thumb here is if your pet's behavior has changed, and if there's lots of the vomiting or diarrhea happening, then I would consider that an emergency. Okay, and the sorts of pathologies happening behind this can be like viral infections, bad viral infections of the stomach, gastroenteritis, uh, foreign bodies, so obstructions like a bone got lodged someplace. Um, you know, so if your dog has puked up 10 times in the last three hours and is becoming very lethargic, it's dehydrating, um, it's it's in a bad spot, and without help, it's in trouble, okay? If your dog goes to the park and eats a, you know, an old portion of, you know, finds a, a, a chip wrapper or something, it comes back and it pukes once and it's bright as a button and no problems tomorrow, you know, that's not an emergency. That doesn't need to be seen immediately. Um, so... In terms of the acuteness, I think is if it's doing either of these things a lot and the behavior's changed or there's any blood in either, then yeah, I think that's something that I would consider an emergency and you need to get that checked out pronto, okay? What if, just say, the diarrhea was a different color or the vomit was a different color, it was totally weird, like the dog's throwing up something that's bright green or the cat's diarrhea is almost black? Okay, well, that's a good question. Um, black diarrhea is never a good sign. Um, the blackness is basically it's digested blood. So usually that would be a sign that there's some blood loss higher up in the intestinal tract, so up in the stomach or the small intestine. And that's, again, that's never normal. So, you know, would you need to brush your cat to the vet if it had black diarrhea? Look, if it did one black poop and it was a little loose and otherwise looked great, I would definitely get it checked out, you know, within a day. Um, but do you need to scoop your pussy cat up and bring him right now? Perhaps not. If your dog puked up something that looked a bit green, then probably that's bile. And often they'll do that because, you know, when... If, like if, if you've watched a cat or a dog be sick, particularly cats, man, they make a meal of that, right? You know, the it's like this pump going for about two minutes before it actually empties. And if there's nothing in the stomach to start with, then it's just going to start sucking stuff up from the small intestine. I'm sorry that if I'm grossing you out there, but and it's going to pull bile up. So that's usually where that yellowy green stuff is. Um, or maybe they ate a bunch of grass because they felt a bit crook. And so the grass pigment can, can give it a kind of greeny tinge as well. So again, I'm not so concerned by the color unless there is blood in there. I'm concerned about how much of something's happened and, um, and whether your pet has changed its behavior significantly. Um, so even, I mean, and, and it might be lethargy, but again, it might be extreme restlessness or you know looking like it's you know it's in pain in some ways like a, a good example would be I saw a West Highland White Terrier some years ago that came in it was totally fine went in the garden uh, came back in like a, you know a bat out of hell and looked like a cat on a hot tin roof it was just jumping around 
and clearly really agitated and it was just retching and retching and retching and you know you you could choose to just see how that went but that had been a big mistake what happened with that dog is it, it raided the garbage cans it found a roast dinner and it eaten the roast dinner remains and it, it swallowed down a, a cooked lamb bone that wedged in its esophagus you know that was a dog that's in trouble now if you leave that for three or four days and then we try and take that bone out there's a good chance we're going to tear your dog's esophagus and that is pretty much the end of the show if that happens so um, you know I think it's all about the behavior change and the degree of something that's happening um, that would get my attention more in color so I hope that answers your question that's a good question all right so I mean this one's kind of self-explanatory I've got one eye on the clock here and I know I know that um, I know we're a little tight on time so um, if your pet does not eat or drink for more than a day particularly drinking there's a risk of dehydration there. Uh, drink about 50 to 60 mils per kilo of body weight to maintain their, their water balance. So if they're not eating, then you can assume that they're losing that much in a day. And they, you know, so you, you could find a four kilo cat that needs to drink somewhere between 200 and 250 mils of water a day. So, you know, that's, you know, it's a little under half a pint. And that's how much fluid it's going to lose if it if it stops drinking. Um, now, add into that, imagine it's being sick and all the fluid it's losing there. You can see how quickly these little little pets can dehydrate, and that's why if they get sick, they can get sick fast. So, policy: if your pet has stopped eating or drinking, and there's not an obvious reason why that would be the case, um, then that warrants a checkout. Okay, now, if you just change your cat's food, like you forgot to buy its favorite and you put down some replacement you got from the pet store and it doesn't like it, slightly different story. Okay, if there's an obvious reason like that, then you don't need to be calling us up every five minutes for that sort of thing. Um, but if, it's, if everything's been steady and consistent and then they just stopped eating and drinking, particularly drinking, get that checked out. Okay, it might be nothing, but you will never be sad that you got that thing checked out. Okay, now the last one is more aimed at dog owners, and and more specifically, we're talking to the dog owners with those with big breed dogs, particularly deep chested breeds, so boxers, Weimaraners, um, old English sheep dogs, German shepherds, Labradors, Retrievers. Great Danes, Mastiffs, those big dogs that have got a whole lot of space in their chests and in their in their in their the forward part of their 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 tummies. Any big dog that gets a big swollen stomach, there is a very scary chance that it's gotten a, a, a what's called a bloat um, or a twisted stomach. Okay, now that is without surgical treatment that animal is going to die and it's going to die very miserably okay um, a twisted stomach blows up and blows up and blows up just like the bladder would do except it's blowing up with gas and it happens faster um, and what it starts to do is compress in all the blood vessels so blood doesn't get back to the heart so the dogs go into shock and collapse very quickly and they just feel terrible um, so you can lose a dog in a matter of hours from a, a twisted stomach. So, you know, this one this one you can prevent. Okay, a lot of these things you can't prevent, but this one you can. So if you have a dog that is a big breed dog, um, that is a risk of this, well, let me tell you the statistics as to why you should take preventative action and not. I'll, I'll give you some numbers on this, okay? So um, the dogs that get twisted stomachs, if you're if your dog gets a twisted stomach, it has a no better than 50-50 survival chance, even with surgery. Okay. Um, if your dog gets through the surgery and has that has that treatment, chances are you're going to spend between four and six thousand dollars doing it. Um, there's a far better way, and you can have a little. I call it a tummy tuck. It's got a fancy name called a gastropexy, but these guys can have a little gastropexy done where the, the you just you just stick the stomach wall to the internal body wall, and it stops the twist being able to happen. So they can still 
bloat up, but the stomach cannot twist, and that's crucial because it stops the life-threatening condition happening. And that's a relatively inexpensive procedure, and the cool thing about it these days is we can do that keyhole-assisted. So we do tummy tucks, and they cost anywhere from $1,000 to $1,500, depending on the size of your dog. Um, and they can also be done at the same time as desexing. So all these these large breed dog puppies, that's a really smart thing to do. It's going to save you heartache primarily down the track, but um, save you money potentially as well. So, you know, uh, feel free to talk to us about you know the keyhole surgery that can be done. And it's it's really because it's keyhole, it's done through a, a, a you know a cut that's one inch long compared to traditionally. Like to do that technique, not many people did it because you had to make a pretty big hole in their tummy to do it. Well, with the keyhole surgery we do now, that's not necessary. So, takeaway here is if your dog gets a swollen stomach. I don't care what time of day or night it is, get them directly to your vet. That's essential. Okay. And so I guess the takeaway from all of these things is act quickly. It is always, I, I, I lose count of the many times I say this in my consult room, and people feel embarrassed sometimes to come in with something they think's nothing. And I'm like, well, look, never feel embarrassed about taking your pet to the doctor if you're worried about it. That's what we're here for. And we would always prefer you to come in and have something that you checked out that was nothing. Then you stay at home with something that was a problem we should have seen and the window of opportunity to fix and save your pet's life closes. And it can close fast in some of these conditions. So act quickly because these things are just a bit of a time bomb waiting to happen. Okay. Um, these things can be kind of scary and it's always the case that you know remain calm all right um, try to remember there's there's help at hand I call vets and we're we're never far away okay but call us we're your first port of call Google is awesome I love Google and there's a lot of cool information out there and you you do have to be careful where you get your information from but there are certain situations you're doing your pet a major disservice if you go to Dr. Google first so call us first if we don't think it's an emergency we will tell you so okay we are not here to just drag you into the clinic for things that are nothing we are here to look after your pet and we're your first port call in doing that okay if your pet cuts itself, please try and stop that bleeding. And it, you know, I think every pet owner should have a first aid kit. And um, you know, maybe Jess, I'm going to write a blog about that and just say what I would have in, in a first aid kit. But one of the things I definitely have is a bandage. And you know, we can sell you some bandages; they're inexpensive. Heck, you can just get some bandages from your chemist. But the cool ones we have are. They're sticky to themselves, they're easy to put on, but they won't stick to your pet's fur. And we're more than happy to teach you how to put a bandage on your pet's foot. That can be a lifesaver. And, you know, I remember one little dog, Wilco, where, you know, I told you about him earlier, but what I didn't tell you was the client was right next to our hospital. But she wasn't a regular client of the hospital. Now, she was a client of the branch surgery where I worked. And so she knew she was nearby the hospital, but she didn't know the directions there. So she drove three miles back to the branch surgery, having walked about five minutes across the park from where her dog lacerated its foot, walked in the front door of the, the branch surgery, and her dog was sheet white. His name was Wilco, and he's a border collie. And I looked at him and thought, oh my God, he has lost so much blood, we're going to have a fight on our hands. Well, we got him onto fluids to support him, first of all. The first thing we did before we did that was put a massive big pressure bandage on there to stop the bleeding because it was pumping out. Um, then we got him a blood transfusion and it stabilized him and then we were able to go in and repair the damage. And I have this beautiful photo of, of Wilco running around in the park um, after his tendons repaired and his you know, he just looked great afterwards. But he was such a close call. So, you know, like a $5 bandage can save your pet's life in that situation. And you, you would be hard pushed to do any harm. You just wrap it around there tight as hell and get to the vet. Uh, you're not going to cut off circulation. I mean, you're trying to cut off circulation. That's that's the aim. So, you know, you do not want to leave that bandage on for, for a long time. So you've got to get to the vet. 
Um, but if, as long as you get to the vet within, you know, say half an hour of putting a dressing like that on, you're not going to cause any harm. Okay, and you may well save your pet's life. And know where you're going. Okay, so you know, I, I would say it's essential to have your vet's number speed dialed in. I would say it's essential to have like uh, I would have a, on smartphones now. You can set a link page on your home page, and you can just set a, a, a tile on your home page that's like a Google map to your practice. And then most of them have GPS navigation out, or you can set it in your GPS. Like know where you're going, know where your nearest vets are going to be. Um, and once you're on the move, then call us so we can make the preparations ready to. We can have everything ready for the moment you walk through the door. But get on the road and then let us know that you're coming. You know, cut down the time wherever possible. Okay. Don't home medicate your pet if you think it's not right. Um, that's just going to cause problems. And don't just see how things go. We know how they go in these situations. They go very, very badly and sadly. And I don't want that to happen for your pets. Okay. All right. So we're kind of at the end of the presentation there, Jess. So I just wanted to draw everyone's attention to this cool little widget we've got as a little gift for coming online tonight. We've got our own little, so you don't have to take notes from the presentation. We've got this little pet ER fridge magnet um, that we're more than happy to send you out. Uh, and you can just stick that on your fridge, okay? And even if you're not a client in our vicinity, we don't mind that at all. We just rather you have the information so you know, like those times when you've got to call your own vet up. Now, in order to get that, I didn't want to put up this huge big URL that would be hard for you to type. So this is a, a little little web address. Put in bit.ly forward slash capital P lowercase et capital E-R. Um, and we will send you that out as well. Okay, it may just save your pet's life. So, Jess, that's it. I'm out for this evening. What yeah. you got? So much. Got? Give me that. some questions. We've got a couple of minutes. Um, I'm conscious of everyone's time, but hit me with what you got. All right. Well, I've got a couple of questions here. So the first is from Jamie. She's up in Wyong. She wants to know if she suspects that her dog has eaten something bad. Is there anything she can do to make it vomit before she brings it to the vet? So just okay. some chocolate. Uh, okay. Um, yeah, there are, but I would be careful about it. Um, you know, if if you're in a position to get to the vet quick, you know, it's one of those ones where bring the thing you think th that your your pet ate. Okay, so if you think it ate some rat bait bring the packet of rat bait so we can see exactly what's there. If you think it ate chocolate, bring the chocolate wrapper so we know how much, what kind of chocolate it was. That sort of detail really, really matters to us. And that sort of half an hour is really the golden half an hour. Now, if you're miles away from another vet, from any vet, um, and your pet does something like that and you've got to make it sick, then, I mean, one, your first aid kit can can, can contain things that can kind of help with that and one of the things is a uh, you know hydrogen peroxide is actually uh, a, a solution it's a three percent peroxide solution can induce vomiting but I'm a little hesitant to recommend people do that because if you get the wrong strength solution you're just going to burn your dog's esophagus um, uh, and there are far more effective things that we can give in the clinic. So if you're in a bind, then you could give a small amount of 3% of hydrogen peroxide, and that, that will induce vomiting. But you've also got to be careful, because if sometimes you don't want them to throw things back up. Like, if it's something that's likely to damage your pet's esophagus, let me tell you, operating on an esophagus is a nightmare that carries massive risk of infection, and, and it's just bad news. And you do not want to go there. If your pet's eating something and it needs to come out surgically, it's almost always better just to take it out of the stomach because that is a much, much lower risk procedure and they almost always get better from that without too many problems. Okay, and because we are running out of time, we'll just use one more question. For those whose questions didn't get answered, Dr. Dave will address them to you privately by email, so please don't get offended. We're just running out of time. I do have one from an owner of a dog with epilepsy, so she's in the ride area and her name is Judith. She wants to know, she was told by someone that 
if her dog's seizing and she needs to rush to a vet, that if she puts an ice pack on her back and gives it some honey, that will help sort of stabilise it, or not quite stabilise it, but get it to the vet a bit safer. Is that? Um, in theory, those things are not... They're not dumb things to do, Judith. Um, in practice, I would be really careful about giving a dog that's having seizures honey because they would bite your finger off and you would know nothing they would know nothing about it but there there's a lot of involuntary movements and spasms happening honestly if I were close to a vet I would just get them to the vet because an ice pack by the time you've messed around doing that I don't think that's going to make too much of a difference the sorts of the degree of seizures that an animal that is going to be getting into difficulties with overheating and blood sugars, like you're not going to save that animal just by giving some honey in its mouth and putting an ice pack on it. They need to have the seizure stopped and stopped fast, and that needs that needs medications that only vets carry. And a lot of those dogs, we actually anesthetize them fully and keep them, you know, keep them anesthetized to normalize their function because then. You know, they're just like uh, we 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 breathe for them, and um, and we can control their blood glucose levels and their temperature much easier at that point. But you know, I, I wouldn't mess around with those things if I was you, Judith. I would just get directly to the vet. And and in like in metropolitan areas, even if it happens out of ours, there is there are many um, many emergency centres open all night that will be able to help you out. Awesome. Well then, once again, thank you, Dr. Day, for taking the time to teach us about pet emergencies. I hope everyone has had a good time and learned a lot. I know I have. For those who want that widget, again, it's bit.ly forward slash P-E-T capital E-R. So that is to get your free magnet. You'll just have to fill in your details and it will be sent to you in the mail. So thank you, Dr. Dave, and everyone, good night. Thanks, Jess. Thanks, everyone, for coming on, and um, I hope we'll see you in the clinic soon, but not with an emergency. <laughs> <laughs>